Thank you, Susan. It's absolutely a pleasure being here and moderating such brilliant folks on the panel. Thank you, uh, Abhay, Hemant, Shruti, and Millie for being here and discussing this very, very important topic, which is taking a multi-pronged approach to innovation. So I'll just set some context for the audience before we start deliberating on this. Um, our hypothesis is that to meet the innovation mandate or actually execute the strategy of your company, there's no one innovation lever that will uh, help you do that. And you need to tap into multiple sources. You need to work with internal teams, the startup ecosystem, uh, as well as academia and other partners to really execute on those mandates. So that's what we're here to deliberate. Uh, without further ado, I'll get started. Uh, Shruti, I'd like to start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about what Cisco's strategy is and what is the multi-pronged approach you're taking? Sure, thank you so much, Divya. The post-lunch session, now you were asking me about a multi-pronged approach. Did we just have um, rice or only roti in there? You gave us a whole good spread. You gave us, you know, so many varieties of paneer, so many desserts, and, and that's the whole fun, right? How can we you know, survive on just a dal and uh, rice and just roti alone? We need flavors. We need all of the fun. And that's where the adventure is. That's where the learning is. And that's where we are trying to see if we can really you know, make a difference to the world. Because the world is also a very unique place with so many different facets. You know, at Cisco, we work on digital transformation of sorts, where we're looking at not just for today, but we are building for tomorrow. We are not just concerned about valuation, we are concerned about value that we can provide to the ecosystems, to the environments that we live in. We are looking at impact of various sorts uh, using technology as a driver. You know, how can technology act as a vehicle for solving the problems that we are seeing around us? The Bangalore traffic, for instance, you know, continues to be a challenge for all of us, you know, except for those that live around in the Whitefield area, like Millie. So when we are looking at challenges of, of this complex nature, you know, it's not sufficient to work on a singular approach. You definitely need very many things to converge. So when Cisco looks at it, we're looking at it from a country point of view. How are we looking at digital transformation for India? We're looking at digital transformation for the world. So you're working with the international players. So one key thing is the government and the policy. So this is one biggest driver for us to see where the agenda of the country is and the globe is. The second thing is around technology, the trends that we are seeing around us. Because with every change, you know, supposing TVS had to innovate, say, two centuries back, you'd be probably constructing some nice bullock cards. And yeah, maybe Cisco would be innovating on pigeons. Yeah, but today, fast forward to all the technologies that we have, I think we are trying to leverage on the advancements that we have in the disruptive space. So that's the second thing, that we place a heavy emphasis on where the direction of technology is heading to and look at innovating from that front. We started working on Meta even before Facebook made that big bang declaration about rebranding themselves and we'd already built the Meta for startups calling it as Kalki, you know, true to its name. The third pillar is on culture. So when I say culture, it is, you know, when I joined, you know, stepped into my professional career, I had options to be part of an MNC, I had an option to be part of a startup. When I chose to join the startup, everybody had this question, hey, didn't you get an offer there? You know, are you not that good? You know, that sorts. But I think that's the conviction that you have. You have the belief that this is something that's on the growth path. You have a belief that this is the space to go, this is the trajectory to tread. And if this is weaved into the system, today our honorable minister at the digital summit has said that shadi.com has the most you know, number of people enrolling as startup founders. You know, the wave is already there, it's set in. So with that culture coming in, um, the first mover's advantage, which we've seen coming with the e-commerce wave, we are seeing that 
proliferating to other areas as well. We were talking about quantum tech and how the movement is going to happen in those trajectories. So this culture of do I make the move or do I stay put? So this is going to be very key. So we're working on all of these to see, can I drive it from scratch? We are evangelizing. So my key approach to this is evangelizing, making sure that entrepreneurship is on everybody's mind. I'm making things happen. There is no use, you know, delivering 100 plus talks and, you know, uh, just telling people that this is good unless I do it myself. So the biggest thing that I do is make it happen. Unless you get those small wins, we're not getting, going to get to the bigger wins. So the second key approach that I have is by doing it. And the third thing is when we are done with it, now you have a model. You have a model to emulate. You have a template for success. So can we go beyond the boundaries and expand to the other geographies? Could we look at newer markets, newer use cases? So those are my three approaches and you know the different pillars that I focus on. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Shruti. So um, talking about making it happen, Millie, can you tell us a little bit about what you are making happen uh, in Diageo and uh, um, what is it that you're focusing on internally? What are some of the areas that you are uh, leveraging the external ecosystem for? So I would say for everything, you know, because uh, people ask me why do you uh, why do you engage with the startup ecosystem or why do you rely on external partners? And I'm like, how else? What do you expect an Alcobev company to do? You know, we know how to make the best alco beverages in the world you give us a liquid uh, uh, a beverage and we'll tell you every molecule that is there in it you give us a piece of machinery ai ml we don't know the difference we are lost it's like asking a fish to climb the tree so if it wasn't for using the ecosystem as a strategy like every time we launch a challenge we launch a lot of so businesses have started coming to ventures i had something called ventures and open innovation also continues to roll up to me. So in one part of my life, of course, it's all hardcore about investments into the startup world. But a very large part is about open innovation. And when business leaders come to me from supply chain, logistics, finance, marketing is a big one now. I'm, I'm realizing as they come to me that we don't have the answers. We have to look outside. And the rate and speed at which innovation is happening. In fact, if you if you go to my LinkedIn and see all the challenges we've lost, hackathons in the past, and we've been able to thankfully, thanks to the startup world, that 100% success rate. And we have a floodgate open every time. I mean, Shruti, Hemant, Abhaya here. What is it about? Shruti, you know, this is the challenge and this is what we've run into. Do you have startups that can, you know, address this? Abhaya, they are my ecosystem. I don't have internally that expertise. So it is like, how else would you expect us to, you know, to solve the problems? And uh, I always say, in fact, uh, I can just share one, you know, uh, experience because I was there at the plant, which is on the outskirts of Bangalore, somewhere between Bangalore and Mysore on Tuesday. And uh, one of the startups was briefing us. So we're trying to, you know, end of line, you have bottles and the end of line, you have inspections. They're all manual. We're trying to digitize it and automate it. And they were giving a briefing of 20 minutes on what that technology is. And my startup supply head looks at me and says, Millie, this POC is worth this learning. We've learned so much about technologies in this 20 minutes. So I always say the heroes are, you know, I don't know how many startups are there in the room. Uh, you need to applaud yourselves. Uh, the heroes and the learning is there, no more on this side. So as much as people think we are giants and we have a lot to teach, no, it's that side. On this side. <laughs> yeah, we are cheerleaders <laughs> for sure. So that's I can just share that in short. That's how we work. Got it. So you mean some of the core areas that you focus on internally, but when it's coming to technology, right. you are uh, really leveraging the startup ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Uh, Abhay, let's move to you. Let's hear a little bit about what the multi pronged approach for TVS looks like today. Sure. So just to provide a little bit of clarity, right, uh, our context behind that, TVS has a group of 90 companies. Now, I particularly deal with about 8 to 10 of them, which are again very diversified, right? So most people have heard about uh, TVS Motor Company, right, which is into two wheelers, and three wheelers as well, right? And uh, globally a six-person market share in two-wheeler market. So 
and, and then there's TVS Credit, which is into the NBFC and FinTech side, TVS Emerald, which is into real estate and so on and so forth, right? So lots of these diversified businesses under the group. And uh, the innovation aspect, when I look at it, right, I've been in TVS for about four and a half months, but what I've realized so far is that, you know, uh, if, if I just focus on the TVS motor company bit itself, we have had humongous number of bikes. That's why we have that kind of a market share today as well, right? And it is not possible to do so without a very strong internal innovation DNA, right? When I say internal innovation DNA, of course, there's R&D teams who are working on building out products, which is running safe for the consumers, right? For commuting, for, you know, premium side, for experiences and so on and so forth. Uh, but then a lot of these have, we have to keep disrupting Right, so for that, there is a combination of internal innovation and external innovation parameters that come in both, right? You can't exclude one from the other. Internal innovation, because they're auto veterans who've been sitting in the space for 30 years and they understand a few business aspects very, very clearly. I mean, I don't see any TVS bike on fire so far, right? So there's a lot of R&D engineering that has gone into it. There's a lot of innovation around that, but having said that, everything cannot come in-house, right? We are, at the end of the day, we, are, you know, we have a limited number of people and there's so many people outside and we have to tap into, right? Some of this external innovation ecosystem that we tap into are loosely held innovators. These are scientists who are working on developing various new technologies and we tap into that. We work with the academic institutions, you know, we have a uh, lot of institutions across the globe, include the, including the IITs and IIMs that, you know, and uh, Warwick in UK and so on and so forth, that we do a lot of research and development activities with. Similarly, we do a lot of uh, partnerships. Uh, for example, we'll plug in Alliance, you know, CII and so on and so forth, where, you know, we try to work together with them to really solve for these challenges. Uh, of course, the third one is startups, right? Uh, from having deployed our ARVR application on our mobile app using Avtar, which is a Sequoia funded startup, to a lot of very young startups like Altizon that we invested in or uh, Tagbox that we invested in. Uh, similarly, a lot of acquisitions as well. So we have done with a good number of startups across the different sectors, a lot of startups uh, with startups POCs. Some of them have moved into production across technologies such as IoT, AI, ML, AR, VR, and all emerging technologies. But then there's also a constant push around uh, figuring out how do we partner most effectively. So sometimes it's the route of investment, sometimes it's the route of acquisition, sometimes, uh, and you must have read in the news, recent uh, acquisitions across the globe as well, right? So it's a multi-pronged approach, that is how we take it, look at it, bringing all these innovation pieces together to actually create an impact. Because for, for example, even for TBS Motor Company, it's not just about commute, right? Like I mentioned earlier, it's safety involved you know, commute in time involved, the overall experience involved. And that is, at the end of the day, that matters the most. Got it. Great. Hemant, what about you? How are you looking at the multi-pronged approach at Bosch? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, good to hear from all these uh, <laughs> fellow panelists, right? So, uh, we talked about Cisco as a corporate, how it works internally and externally. We talked about uh, Millie talking about how uh, Diego actually looks at external uh, startups for innovation. We talked about Abai working in a company which is so uh, old, so veteran and so experienced, which is actually becoming more and more successful with innovation. So Bosch, uh, I come from Bosch. Uh, so Bosch is a company which is there uh, in the globe since more than 175 years now and uh, globally spread across uh, uh, 144 regions, uh, entities uh, across the globe. So in India, uh, fortunately, Bosch is something where we are the second largest R&D center outside of Germany. And uh, we have close to 40,000 plus uh, associates working. And this actually is a different dimension, right? So if you're talking about a company which has uh, 20, 30 people, then the chance of innovation is much lesser. While you, if you have a larger mass of people, so it, it becomes imperative for us to also extract the value coming in from that 40,000 people, right? So even if you look at 10% of 40,000 people, it's a huge amount of people who can contribute to innovation, who have those ideas. Some of them are good ideators, idea hunters, while some of them are good strategists, some of them are good executioners. How can you bring the right team together to innovate? So uh, in Bosch, I will, I'll have multi-dimension in multi-pronged, right? So uh, one of the dimension is um, 
in one of the dimension we have uh, core adjacent and uh, uh, what we call as explore or transformative right or disruptive so core is the f bread of the company right uh, for bosch it is automotive consumer goods industrial uh, applications and energy so in these where do we innovate all right so this is the business unit will actually invest because they need to keep going and here we talk about investment, mentorship, support coming in from the actual uh, people driving the businesses, right? So adjacency also is taken care by them. But then when, you, when it comes to disruptive, the current businesses do not believe in disruption, right? So it, it has to be at the top. Someone needs to say, guys, if we need to sustain in the future, we need to invest on it right now. And that is very critical, believe me, because... If you see what was there maybe five years before to what is there today, uh, Samsung's, NVIDIA's, Apple's, Google's, they're all building cars, right? None of us would have imagined. So the kind of, let's say, competition which uh, the traditional General Motors, Ford, Fiat, now has to look at as something which they would never have imagined. Same as with EV, EV disruption bringing in from the uh, internal combustion engine. So to keep it short, you never know what comes next and disruption is quite key and it's important for an organization to be at least a part of the organization, right? Not everyone will do it. So set up a separate team focusing on innovation, doing a future thinking, right? Uh, aligning with the market, looking at the market, scouting, understanding what's happening and startups are, we see investment or startups are a good way to understand where the new technology is, where the new market is. The second dimension is we look at internally. So how can we really help the ideas coming in from the employees? So I am a part of a, a unit in Bosch called Grow, which is a separate legal entity in Germany. And there is no hierarchy. It's a flat organization. There's a CEO in Germany and eight hubs spread across the globe, right from North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, India, China, Japan, and Singapore. And all the hub leads along with the CEO, CFO, and CTO, we are the leadership team. And our role is to identify the right pseudo matured uh, internal ideas which are developed into POCs by employees, take them up, fund, give them the series A, series B funds, uh, not external startups, internal startups. We mentor, nurture, fund, and we help them to scale across the globe. And these are all startups which have a high potential to reach a billion euros within 10 years, which means that fifth year of their operation, they are in 170 to 100 million euro and this needs dedication this needs a different mindset this needs a different thought process you cannot pitch these guys with the normal service oriented deliveries right so you need to look at right from compensation the infrastructure what you give it's important to know that better so this is the second dimension on internal inside out innovation right so we talked about outside in and uh, we talked about the inside out and uh, the third is basically where we look at how do we stream out innovation from different streams, right? So we talked about startups being a part of it. We talked about internal innovation ideas being a part of it. We talked about hackathons coming out of it. So innovation culture, building the innovation culture is quite important to sustain. So at Bosch, along all these dimensions, each of the dimension, we have a multi-pronged approach to build, nurture, and sustain innovation. Got it. So this has been multiple approaches that we have discussed so far uh, from all of you. Um, one of the most common questions that we get, especially with um, you know, GCOEs who have been very focused on the core itself and now thinking about innovation and you know, hoping to do it in a little more structured way, uh, is where do I get started? Is it my internal teams because, you know, maybe that's the easiest way to do it or uh, is there a better starting point? So uh, this is an open question to the panel. Any of you want to uh, take it up first? Yes, Millie? So I'll, I'll, I'll be very upfront. I don't know, I mean, Shruti, Hemant, uh, Abaya here and, and what they feel. I think innovation, when you come to a large organization, which is heavy and it should be on BAU, uh, if I did not have the immunity protection of the authorities mm -hmm. to do it, craft it my way. So we formed ventures only in October 2020 and one person department continues to be, as on date, I'm still a one person department, but 
I think innovation also needs to be, you know, secluded, secured, probably secured is a better word, and needs a lot of immunity and free hand, which you don't get in BAU. It should never, ever be clubbed with. So I call my division BAU, it's business as unusual. The thinking here is very different. It's very diverse from how, you know, my counterparts. And that's essential because their BAU runnings give, up, give me all the freeway to even, you know, go ahead and do future forward work. So be it investments, which is inorganic way of, of course, growing the company <coughs> from innovation perspective or open innovation hackathons, which is building, plugging in these technologies externally uh, into the system. So for me, I think that is very, very critical because it is, it is not fair to expect, you know, people who are running the show every day to get the nuances of or have an innovative mindset. So I, I feel, I don't know what they feel, but I feel they're two different, very different mindsets. Got it. Shruti, yes. Add to that and maybe give a triple C formula in there because what you said was very uh, imminent in a large organization. So I would go with a triple C formula where the first C is complaints. Yeah, because it's business as usual first and you will want to focus on business as it was earlier and not, you know, make a dent there. So as long as we are good on the compliance front, the next thing to look at is comparison and how you're looking at competition. We're looking at it both internally as well as externally. We're looking at new stuff coming in from inside. We have the biggest pulse of the customers from within the organization, say the customer support teams, the ones that, that are on the field. So they know the customer's pulse best. So the second wave, I mean, second C is going to be the competition and how do you compare against your competitors? And then the third thing, third C comes, which is the creativity. But it has to go in this order. Creativity is good, but it can't be the foremost one. It is an essential part of innovation, but that would definitely come for me after we have capitalized. It's like the Maslow's hierarchy. It's like getting your you know, most basic needs fulfilled. So which would be getting our compliance ad addressed, then go on to build on what your competition is looking at, what the markets are looking at, and then tap into the creative zones. Got it. I can I can probably add in a little bit. Uh, so love the three C's, right? I think I'm going to remember that one uh, for a long time. So that's great. I've also heard people talking about internal innovation, like and specifically like Heyman just mentioned, right? There are certain organizations which have truly democratized internal innovation, right? And credit due where it's due. But a lot of others talk about internal innovation, wherein you know, given my understanding of what they do. It is not really democratized. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, organizing four hackathons a year, some idea thongs having an idea box there is not internal innovation. Till the time you don't create a formalized structure to absorb ideas, build on that, and create tangible outcomes that are measurable, right? Whatever hypothesis that you're trying to validate, get it validated. Till that time, it's not an internal innovation program. It is not democratized. And then, you know, it's not fair for a lot of these organizations to say, hey, listen, we have a lot of internal innovation happening. Yes, you may be happening it in a particular team, in a particular vertical, mm -hmm. but not across the organization, right? That's where you have to change the culture, the value system, and have a top-down approach to even say probably in the policies of it that, you know, in your annual appraisal, there's a particular aspect that we'll measure you on your innovation potential or your, your impact in the innovation space. So then it actually becomes a real value addition as an internal innovation structure, right? And uh, so far in my learnings, what I've seen is those specific teams, that creativity, the third C on creativity, like Millie also mentioned, uh, you know, which are siloed, can work very aggressively on disruptive innovation. The rest of the organization comes in from incremental standpoint. And that is the differentiator, right? Because uh, like I mentioned, if it's not structured, imagine these are very, very tangible, real-time problems or challenges that I've seen. A manager saying, hey, listen, my associates are working on BAU stuff. Why do I tell them, they have given a brilliant idea and they're capable to build it out, but why do I move them out from our normal operations, day-to-day -day operations and push them into doing something separate, 
right? My impact, uh, my, my work stream's impact is going to suffer. Why do I disrupt my workflow? So all these are very, very obvious challenges that come in. And like Heyman mentioned, you know, there are spin-offs, there are spin-offs happening, they are, you know, they are encouraged to build their own entities as startups within that environment and then again later spinning off as well, right? And infusing funds. That is a brilliant structure to look at, you know, when you really want to tap into internal innovation. Otherwise, the easier route in my head is, you know, you have a definitive use case, you have a startup with, with the definite expertise, you know, do a matchmaking and bring them in and, you know, start showing some immediate impact. Uh, even if it's long term, you, you know, you can drive it milestone driven basis, right? So it's still much easier than driving an internal innovation program end to end. Got it. So I think what I'm hearing from the three of them, and I want to bring you in here uh, specifically, is that one, you align to business and that's where you really start off. And uh, startups might, or external ecosystem might be a quicker way to solve for some of these challenges. Whereas when it comes to internal, it could be more complex. Whereas Bosch has put that entire structure in place very well. So could you tell us a little bit about how you made that possible uh, over time? You know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Shruti, Mili, and uh, Abhay actually talked about uh, very important dimensions, right? Yeah. So one is on how you should actually have freedom for innovation, what Mili talked about. And uh, Shruti actually stressed about the importance of governance compliance. So you have a boundary. Within the boundary, you play around freely, right? Which is not possible in... Uh, and Abhay actually talked about uh, how in some of okay uh, some of the companies or some of the innovation topics are more spoken about for the purpose of innovation and not as from the heart right so because if you are really telling okay i want to allow my uh, associates to innovate you have to give them the infrastructure you have to give them the freedom you have to give them all they need to innovate, right? I mean, people are not asking about money. Uh, they're not asking for more money. They're more asking for, give me all the necessary things and allow me to work freely. I will innovate, I'll get it out. And that is what I very clearly said, which is very important. So, uh, so this, uh, apart from all these things, uh, your question on how is Bosch doing it, right? I mean, it's, uh, I wouldn't say we are there completely, right? So we, in different entities, Bosch is spread out, so, different regions are at a different level of innovation. And that is why um, four years ago, at the headquarters in Germany, they took a call that it doesn't work decentralized, right? So if we have to do disruptive innovation, it has to be a separate stream. And that is why a separate legal entity within Bosch was set up. Complete freedom for funding, for driving as a separate p &L was given to that. And this also was set up as a basic rule company which is not the case for any of the companies in Bosch. So there is a need for a top-driven approach here, without which it will not happen, mm -hmm. right? Second thing, inside these, many a times we start feeling, okay, these guys, the startups are not doing it right. Let me step in. So we should not do that, mm -hmm. yeah? Again, a framework, within that framework, allow them to operate because if we were able to do it, we would have done it. Now, allow others, guide them where they have obstacles, guide them where they have problems, help them network, but that's it. Don't, uh, don't get into their operations, don't get into micromanagement. Very key in innovation because the brightest, passionate minds, they have a different line of thought which we cannot comprehend probably, whoever else is supporting that, and we should allow them to explore that. So it becomes very important that way. And don't treat innovation as a whole. You have the first steps of innovation where you have many ideas coming in and only maybe 10% of it is going to the next level. And as you flow, but there the loss, so fail fast, fail cheap, right? So whatever you are inputting is very less. But as you go along the curve, when you say, we have uh, different clustering, right? We have ideation to strategic, fr strategic framing to ideation, to concept, to validation, to incubation and then scale. And each of these has higher funds, lesser number of topics which are there in each fund, and higher amount of mentorship and support given to the startup once they reach the last stages. So yes. this, I would uh, stop it here. Yes. So I think from all of you, right, you have stressed on the importance of governance <coughs> and top-down, uh, but 
the reality for many GCOEs really is that, yes, I have the talent and I can contribute to innovation or have the ecosystem available and I can contribute, but how do I get that top-down, uh, say, buy-in, right, for whichever approach that I'm taking? So could, um, again, this is an open question to the panel, uh, how do you really get that business alignment and uh, buy-in in a scenario where I'm really starting, you know? from converts uh, yes <laughs> you need converts <laughs> got it you want to tell us so uh, all i'll say is uh, maybe because i started from scratch i see abhay in the same journey you know more power to you abhay uh, shruti is ahead of us heman definitely is at the dream spot because i keep saying disruption is happening outside the organization ventures can be bring it to the peripheral but ultimately, over the years, if we cannot make it sit within the heart of the, at the heart of the organization, then with all these efforts, I don't think we'll be able to match up with our competitors or the best in the breed in the market. So uh, at least when I started, it was uh, a lot of just talking presentations, uh, uh, helping them see the potential. I got uh, one leader out of probably 40, 45 at the top uh, to believe in us. Uh, the, the, the results were, were amazing because, you know, if you read Hina Nagarajan, who's our CEO, her press releases whenever we have, uh, we are a public listed company, USL. So we have shareholders meets. So one of the, you know, innovation projects went very down very well. And uh, that's what, so success breed to success. I think I was just lucky to find that one leader who believed in us and said, I would like to go down this way. And now it's opened the floodgate. So I always say, look for your converts very clinically uh, who will convert to believing in you. Got it. Great. So uh, I think the next time, yes. Don't look at each topic as innovation. As she said, the convert should be at the overall level, right? So if you have invested, look at it from a funding as a ventures. If you have invested one million, Overall, are you getting more than one million? That's sufficient. Don't dig down into, I invested 100,000 here, that guy is not coming out with 100,000 because it's always one out of the 10 or one out of the 20 which will succeed. And that is the formula and our job is to find that one and nurture that one. But the others are also important. There are people who have tried it, tested it, but encourage them and reward them. That is very important. Great. I want to now move on to the importance of execution in this multi-pronged approach, right? Um, and it would be really good if some of you could tell us about how you've built the muscle one to either execute with startups and maybe uh, Shruti, Mali, you can talk about that. Abhay, I definitely want you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, executing in the entire um, startup plus supply chain uh, ecosystem and uh, the SIG that you're talking about and uh, Hemant will then come to, um, you know, Bosch and the internal innovation execution. So maybe we start off with, uh, Mili, would you like to go? How did you build the entire muscle for, um, you know, corporate, your, your entity being able to execute and really work with startups and make those successes happen? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the other side of the story, which is uh, as much as, you know, we invite startups, you know, traditionally it was tough. We saw them as very risky. In fact, our systems wouldn't allow them to even enter. It took a while to open those doors and even ensuring success. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I've uh, even startups think that we are just being very choosy, but I'm sorry when, you know, I have a real problem and I tell startups, this is a real time problem with real challenges. If we could solve it, we wouldn't be coming to you. May the best person win. So very often we get 67, 80 uh, applications. We narrow it down to six, seven, which we come, which come for the demo day and final presentations. We, we a lot paid for POCs to at least two or three of them. Invariably, 50% of them have been failing on when the rubber hits the road. The one that has been succeeding then gets to scale across the length and breadth of the organization. And here we are talking about a 30,000 crore revenue company where our, our unit sizes are very small. So you can imagine it is at least 1.5 billion units you're talking about. So uh, I would just say that we are very strict in choosing and picking our winners. 
But once they are on the ground, I think we give them all the support that they need. We are a complex um, industry, not an organization, uh, just by uh, you know the nature of the regulatory norms. Uh, we say no; they take it takes time to baptize them. So we give them that time. And but the selection process is very very tough. We are not as generous as a lot of other corporates we see. Got it. Great. Um, Shruti, what about you? How did you go about? Um, how do you go about selecting your startups or your partners and then really making them ready as well as your organization ready to work together? So let me ask you this question, <laughs> Divya. Do you drive on Bangalore roads? No, I don't. No? The gentleman at the front, Mr. Vivek, when did you first learn to drive your first car? Okay, so the first time the rubber hit the road, as Mili said, and you are in a traffic signal, and you are, you know, you are on the first gear, your engine turns off. <laughs> you're pretty lucky, you're pretty lucky that way. But even that amount of pause, people are not ready to tolerate at this point of time. Mm -hmm. You know, that amount of downtime, we are not trained to, you know, take it, which means that we will have to be up and running on our feet, which is why we are structured as a startup ourselves. We are structured to train like startup. We are structured to, you know, behave like a startup. And, you know, we have, in fact, at Cisco, the entire, um, you know, construct is based that way. You know, we have all of the functions composed within the organization. You know, though we have the cushion of the larger corporate, like I was saying, we do operate under the compliance, under the framework of what the market demands us to conditionally behave. But we also take it beyond that to ensure we really tap into the outcomes that we want to orchestrate. We want to pivot to the future. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where we want to lead the world into. So the muzzle, in fact, is about identifying the glass, not just the ceilings, but the windows, doors, and all of those, and tapping them to say, are you strong enough? How many could I crack? And these are across functions. These are in the sales, these are in the investments, these are in engineering, you know, talk of any department. The only thing that I really agree with Newton is the law of inertia. Now, it's everywhere. It's about identifying those inertia and really doing the push to get the intended structures in place. And like Millie said, getting that one person who believes in you, that is extremely critical to ensure that you now have the power to start building all of these structures and processes in place so that it empowers you. Like for example, at Cisco, we've now looked at startups of all sorts, right from the bottommost rung, the very early ones, we've built a platform called STEP, the startup engagement platform, which acts at scale, which interacts with startups across stages and grows with them. Now that's the intention. We don't just want to go knock the doors of startups. As they become a unicorn, we don't want to do that. We want to be engaged with them. We want to catch them young, catch them early, identify the top-notch ones, which have the uh, capability to scale up, which have that conviction in, in them to kind of really contribute in the space that they are operating in. So once we do that, we really give them the wings to fly. And this, as I said, involves putting in the right commercial structures, structuring the right offers. These are not in place in larger organizations by default. It's about bringing about that change, building the purpose, getting the mind share with your own leaders, and really working towards that. And that's where the smaller and the bigger wins really play a major role. Like for example, when Cisco did set up the center of excellence at the Bangalore airport in the aviation space, this wasn't what we would normally do. We would probably go with uh, just an infrastructure-based selling. But this is a case where we were able to plug in our sensors in the space where the fuel gets into the aircraft. We were looking at you know, sensing um, when passengers were boarding on, the food getting into the aircraft, because each of these counts and each of these contributes to the delay for you know, an aircraft to take up onto the skies. And every second matters. For the aircraft, for the airline industry, every second the plane is grounded, he's going to, or he, the, the organization is going to incur a loss. So the whole point here is to make sure the plane is flying and what we can contribute to get it up and flying as soon as possible.
So it, it's all about envisioning a difference, uh, br bringing the dots together, which are pretty disparate, not just from a use case and a vertical point of view, but also the structures, because here we got to work with the governmental authorities, we got to work with the partners here, the ISV partners, the SI partners, the startups, and our own engineering teams, which had to do a lot of customizations to get these up and running. So it's about envisioning and marching towards that. Got it. Yes. So have a very strong intent and then connect all the dots on all of the sides to make it happen. Actually, should these organizations prepare these startups to even ad ad be able to deal with or, or solve problems for companies like ours? So that's her work that she's prepared them. And I worked with her startups, by the way. So she's prepared them enough that they come into our system and solve really, really uh, big problems. Some of them have solved like problems that our global counterparts haven't been able to. So building that capability, oh, it's a, it's a big thing she's doing, which I lack. <laughs> I'll accept it publicly. No, so I would just add to that. It's just not about building, right? You yeah. then have to give them newer, bigger challenges to capitalize on. And that's where this kind of partnership really plays well. You're able to give them newer opportunities to build on and expand their business. So glad that we were able to partner towards the startup success. It's a win-win situation. And if I could add a small point on this, right? Specifically, any new corporates who are trying to set up innovation uh, teams or innovation entities and structures and programs, right? Uh, what Shruti probably put it a little mildly is a very big challenge. Now, I, over the last seven, eight years, have been, this is my fourth corporate, right? And I have set up innovation programs. Uh, there's a first iteration to convince a company and the leadership about looking at startups differently, right? In the first iteration, you talk to your supply chain folks, you talk to your procurement folks and say, hey, listen, this is, you need to look at startups from a different lens. And there's a lot of pushback. You talk to your legal, there's a massive pushback. You know, why do we not safeguard our own interests as corporates first is the pushback that we get, right? And then you have to make them understand patiently, month on month, year on year, that you keep evolving to a place where you become startup friendly. And I've done that four times now. So <laughs> I know it's not easy. And uh, the processes that Shruti was talking about, having that structures in place, it may sound very simple from an external standpoint, but the people who are setting that up and bringing about that change in massive hundreds of years old organizations, it's a major, major drive. So I just wanted to kind of elaborate that, you know, if Cisco and Shruti have done that, that's a fantastic amount of effort that goes behind it. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, I'd like you to also talk a little bit about um, the effort that you're putting in together right now and executing something that is slightly more future focused. So uh, the SIG that you're leading with, um, you know, the uh, plugin alliance and the use cases that you're going after, it's basically um, you're focusing on a different pivot or a, a different kind of business model for the startups to arrive at and become more say, commercially ready to work with, uh, you know, the uh, the larger organizations. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, Plugin Alliance has, I think, three or four SIGs, three SIGs, if I'm not wrong. One of them is focused on uh, business model uh, prioritization innovation uh, for startups as well as uh, helping them fundraise, right? I chair that along with two other co-chairs uh, to create a framework uh, and of course, uh, you know, validate certain hypotheses through which we can create meaningful impact, specifically in the lives of Industry 4.0 startups. Now, why Industry 4.0 is because uh, Industry 4.0 startups are normally very R&D intensive, right? And because they are, you know, taking more time for GTM, right, to get out there and commercialize their ventures, uh, either they run dry on funds or they bring in investors sometimes who have very specific KPIs and they're looking for quick returns, right? Quick jump in valuations. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a SaaS model in every industry 4.0 startup, right? And that thereby you can't necessarily see those jumps in valuations very quickly because the product itself is not out for sometimes a couple of years. One of the startups that I was talking about in quantum computing as well as the same case, right? I mean, quantum computing is not mainstream today. It might take them a year or two to even get to a place where they can start commercializing. In those cases, how do we work with those kind of startups to enable them to pivot to models 
that allow them to continuously innovate and continue to uh, continue their R and D activities, but at the same time figure out one way or the other, one channel or the other to keep monetizing and start bringing some inflow of funds. And and you know one of this uh, inflow and more sustainable inflow is the client inflow, right? But sometimes you need more funds, so that's why we also working with uh, VCs. Uh, to figure out the right kind of thesis. Some VCs are already investing in R&D intensive startups, but how do we convey the right messaging and narrative to all the stakeholders, right? When we talk about corporates, and we in this SIG, we talk to corporates as well, and we tell them, hey, listen, when you have to evaluate Industry 4.0 startup, this is the way that you can look at the right kind of KPIs and, and get involved with these startups from a disruptive uh, innovation standpoint, right, where there's more R&D involved and you're talking about a futuristic impact. So set your expectations right. Similarly with VCs that, you know, today you might think about a 10x ROI in a SaaS company, you know, in the, uh, you know, in any, any enterprise space, right. Having said that, in some of these emerging technologies, it may be a binary game of zero and one, but tomorrow if it turns into one and these guys at the forefront of it, you're talking about a 50 to 100 extra turns. So bringing all these stakeholders together is the aim of the SIG and eventually putting out a guide of sorts as a form factor that will be launched for all Industry 4.0 startups. Got it. Thank you, Abhay. Hemant, uh, I'd like you to share a little bit in terms of execution and if you are looking at execution also you have the you know the grow program as well as the dna program that feeds into it so how are you making execution kind of coherent across all of this yeah so uh, the dna program in uh, uh, india and it's also now global so uh, is catering to collecting the right business problems from the business units right and where it's not very core so we don't want to build it and looking, matching it with the startups to get the right startups uh, to really come in and work with the business units to solve the problem, right? So DNA stands for discover, nurture, and align. Discover is the process of problem statement collection and scouting, matching the startup. Nurture is the place where we bring both the business unit and the startups together and nurture them with mentors together as a topic, right? Not just the startups or not the, just the businesses. And the align is the part where, uh, as uh, Shruti said, uh, and Abhay said, and uh, Mili actually touched upon, uh, which they're doing, is the part where you go a long way globally with the startups. Yeah. It's not that I want to just work with them for two months and drop them off, no. The intent is I want to go along with them, scale my business and help them to scale support them to scale and and this is very very important so today we are working with for dna we are working with uh, ginsep germany india startup exchange program getting in startups from germany we are working with the israeli startup program getting in startups from israel we are working with the nascom uh, here as well as we are working with the invest india startup india so uh, digging into into the india startup database and working with it to get the startup so uh, here it becomes important that we are also a bit selfless, as uh, not selfish, but as uh, Shruti rightly said, because at the end, with partners, with startups, it becomes a win-win, right? I, I can't just say, you give it to me, I won't give you anything, right? That doesn't work. So execution here becomes a part of, and, and uh, believe me, I mean, Abai touched upon it, right? It's not easy, right? Uh, on one side, you have... Uh, whether it's Grow or DNA for me or Launchpad for her or Ventures or the Startup Alliance program, you are the face of it, right? As leaders, you are the face of it. And you have to really answer to the management. There's high pressure internally in the organization telling that, let's stop this. It's not working out. I'm not getting it. So it's up to you how you really keep it up and running, bringing in the value, showing the value, extracting the value. And on the other side, you also need to shield the guys who are getting into it because you don't want them to give up too early. Right? So, so for them, many a times, I mean, at least in my personal case, I'm also caught up, I was caught up in certain issues where uh, in the initial stage of this growth startup for digital twin i4.0, People at higher engineering levels from Germany, from uh, US actually came and said, why are you guys doing it? Who asked you to do? Who gave you the authority, right? Mm -hmm. Only because it was a central independent entity in Germany set up, which was directly with the CEO. We were able to ward them off and tell this is authorized. Either you work with us or you complain. Today they're working with us. 
they have come to us and telling, can we develop this together, right? And these kind of execution problems are more, and it's important that leaders who are leading this actually shield the startups or both ways, internal or external, and take the brunt. We'll have to take a lot of brunt, but we have to stand up and say, this is how it will go. Either give me the authority or I'm out. So this is like, uh, you know, those thankless jobs. We don't get any awards or recognition, right? Your business partners, your startups do. And when they do, have you seen in those movies, right? Uh, Mera dos US gaya, Amir ban gaya, right? So when our startup partners or business partners succeed, we have that feeling, right? It's not necessarily that, you know, we get the riches of it, but the feel good factor that, you know, we have created that impact is, is the thanks that, you know, we get, right? Not in any other way. Yes, um, we're running out of time. I need to open it to the audience, but there's one question I'm really itching to ask all of you. You'll have um, said a lot of things, but one thing that's come out is innovation seems to, in a corporate, seems to be so difficult. Don't you ever feel like giving up? And uh, the, the award or the impact that you're talking about really takes so long to, you know, <laughs> come so what keeps you going or what make sure you don't give up and you know stay true to, to that intent like on a personal level okay. anyone I, I don't know so it sounds very cliched when i'll put it this way but then you know there's been a very strong voice since a few years now when i say a few years probably over a decade now which has made me shift career paths and this voice has always told me that, you know, can you really leave a legacy? Can you really create an impact in the lives of millions of people, right? And you can do it in multiple ways. I chose innovation as a path. I know it is thankless. Of course, I've experienced it over the years that I realized it's thankless. But then, you know, when some of those success stories come out and you see the joy in the lives of, or in, on the faces of your partners, or the impact that they're creating, the jobs that they're creating, the actual, and again, you know, it sounds very cliche, you know, I'm not trying to make it look very sugar-coated, but this does feel good at a soul level, right? It does not make me rich, at least not directly. So, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, that, that soul satisfaction that allows you to sleep at night peacefully gives you, that one success story gives you that push to keep going back at it again and again. Anyone else wants to add? Yeah, yes. uh, I mean, no. It just gives a high, right? Uh, it's, it's the normal mundane BAU is something which is good, which will give you that nine to five. But this is something which keeps you excited, which keeps you thinking, the grace is running. And, and because of this, I want to read more and more books. I want to see more and more uh, movies based on strategy. I want to learn more and more. And at the end of the day, uh, as he said, when, when something succeeds, right, it's, it's important. And the thing is pers per maintaining that perseverance till that succeeds. And then everyone looks up to you and says, see, I brought him here. This is the yeah. guy who did it. Yeah. yeah? And uh, this is important, right? Because it's not a day-to-day -day success. Someone telling you, yeah, maybe it's one year, two years, three years. But at the end of three years, the success becomes magnified. Yeah. And if you are there with that patience, with that perseverance, dedication, and the commitment, it, it is definitely worthwhile doing it. Yeah? I was an entrepreneur. I, I set up an internal startup. And everyone said, this is going to fail. This is going to fail. Just my core team and my boss who had funded it believed in it. And today, it is successful. It is, in fact, an AI-based platform for personalization. And it is running in few of the premium vehicles today, providing personalization to the users within the car. And the same people who are told it will not succeed are today coming in and saying, congratulations, you proved what, was, what we thought was not possible. And, and it's there, but it's late. And I think it also gives us a different dimension of thinking, yeah. right? Which is not possible in the, but you'll have to fight it out. Lot of things to fight. Got it, super. Should I open it up? Yeah, maybe. Okay, go ahead. Great. Yes, we can. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening, this guy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is on uh, uh, with the pressure on the bottom line. Like, uh, how are you thinking uh, sustainable innovation? When I say sustainable innovation, it's on the benefits on the environment and uh, maybe reduction on the carbon footprint, which has been like one of the topics spoken. 
So I wanted to hear one of the uh, speakers from the panel. So that's a stream of work, I would say, especially for us. Yes, it's very, very high because we are uh, not in the digital world. We are in the physical, you know, product world, which has caps and bottles and labels and monocartons and cartons. So yes, there is a lot of work going on internally on reducing each aspect of this. And we've come a long way. We are a carbon neutral, not a carbon negative company. Water uh, recycle rate is much higher than most uh, companies. So we have done our bit, we are still doing. So it's a, it's a core area of focus for us and continues to be a continuous improvement area. So we are at it all the time. Yeah, thanks Mili. Great, we had one more question. Hi, I'm Aparna. Uh, I'm coming from Nokia, a company where we don't look at external in innovations, but uh, try to foster internal innovations because we are heavy on uh, IP front. So my question to the panelists here is that I heard a lot about how you have uh, a kind of a global program to ensure that every division is participating in innovation and so on. So that's I'm part of a transformation team where we try to push all our R&D units to uh, really focus on innovation so that we are a few years ahead on the evolution game. Uh, my question here is, uh, we see a lot of difference in terms of uh, R&D units based out of different regions performing differently in, in terms of how they handle innovation. What is your mantra to, uh, to ensure that you are fostering innovation equally despite cultural differences or what are the cultural differences that you perceive? Uh, see, as I said, I mean, I'll keep it very short, but it's important that the top management believes in it, right? Because there is a independent investment required to foster and nurture innovation, which people should not think that they'll get the return within one year, right? But when it comes back after six years or eight years, it will be massive. But someone has to believe in it and abide by it. That is very, very important. And when that happens, automatically all the things happen. So I can probably share some experience, you know, having um, been not really an entrepreneur, but having been part of many hackathons and running uh, on the other side too, right? So belief is extremely important. Having a sponsor is extremely important. I think I would go by this principle of effectuation where we think that only if I have everything I will go and solve a given goal. It's more about what I want to achieve. Set a given goal. People will have so many different approaches to get there. Your stakeholders will come by, your you know, resources that you gather on the way, you know, all of it will come by. And I think that is the uniqueness that global organizations also have. My European counterpart may be thinking of different things to solve a given collaboration issue while I may be looking at it differently. And that adds to the product beauty, right? What you get in the final deliverable is really now multinational truly in nature. So I think you should really appreciate the fact that you have global teams to work with who are bringing in different dimensions to it, who are thinking about different facets of it. And at the end of the day, we're all marching towards a unified goal. So those are all the questions we yeah. can take. I'm so sorry. OK, one last question. Thank you. Can we take uh, okay. My name is Lakshmi Narayanan from Samsung. Uh, first of all, uh, congrats. It's an insightful panel discussion. We are talking about internal innovation and the beginning of the execution. Imagine there is a moment an idea has been selected. and It has to go through POC making making into a full product. There is a kind of battle running in the minds of people. For example, if it is an employee, he has a fear of failure. First he has to leave his current project, then come out, he will have failure. And for team heads, he may have uh, you know, thoughts about losing an employee or losing a resource from his deliverables and project. How do you overcome this situation? It's a very practical problem. Any experience sharing is appreciated. I think the first thing itself where you are looking at an approach where you will have to have that employee leave his comfort zone and go do outside of his comfort zone, that is an issue that the organization has to address in the first place. It is the ownership of the leader to ensure within that comfort zone, within the 
uh, framework of what his organization has, can I give that to the employee? Can I still have him on the roles, but give say 20% or 10% of a time to innovate on his or her ideas? And can you look at funding based on what it really takes to get there? Some of it may be uh, achievable in a matter of few weeks or days. Some may need to uh, you know, take a longer marathon path. So it, it really is up to the leader to play a very strategic, pivotal role in providing that structure to the employees. I'm sure you can add more to it. No, I completely agree on that, Shruti. In fact, uh, there was a phrase, use fear of failure, right? And, and that, again, like you mentioned, Shruti, is an organizational, uh, you know, behavioral aspect that they need to address. Uh, that, you know, there's failure, first of all, let's stop looking at failure in a negative, with a negative connotation, right? Failure is learning, right? As long as the leaders have done their job well in putting together a meaningful hypothesis, the KPI is to validate that within those frameworks. If there's a failure, that means we have not been able to achieve or validate that particular hypothesis. That doesn't mean there's not been a lot of learnings coming out of it. So, you know, in, in a lot of uh, European countries, if I'm not wrong, supposedly the so-called uh, failed entrepreneurs get fantastic jobs, right? They're pulled back into the corporate world because they failed at doing something, but they brought in those learnings. We need to bring that thinking in, and this again needs to imb be imbibed into the value system and the culture of the organization. Great. Thank you so much, Ave, Mili, Hemant, and Shruti. You have definitely been insightful, but you've really been inspirational today. So thank you so much for sharing all your experience with us. Thanks, thanks, thanks.